Well, so I always start these interviews off by saying, welcome back to the Metropolitan Culture Corner, no? But that's because I just assume that you guys have been following what we've been doing, this whole series of interviews, since March 2020. But you know what they say about assuming, right? So, if this is the first time that you're tuning in to the MCC, welcome. You can catch all of the interviews from the past year on Metropolitan's official YouTube channel, and I encourage you to subscribe, because then you'll be the first to know about all these awesome interviews that we're publishing from month to month, right? Right. This month, we talked to Frank Aleo, whose roots as a lighting designer for the stage were only the starting point for a decades-long career that integrates videography and truly stunning visual effects with this range of innovative and unusual formats. His objective is always to make the experience not only visual, but also immersive and emotional. I discovered Aleo's work when I read an article describing how the set of his production for the 2019-2020 Liceo opera season included giant robot arms, and I just had to know more about this guy, you know? His work has captivated audiences audiences in some of the most important theaters and opera houses in Europe and on other continents as well, such as La Scala in Milano, La Monet in Brussels, the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, among many others, including Barcelona's own Liceo. But his work is not limited to the stage. He has also worked in hybrid creative disciplines such as audiovisual production or mapping on the facades of emblematic buildings like the Barcelona City Hall or the citywide festival La Merce or the Catalan Parliament Building, as well as designing and directing events of all kinds, even writing and directing for television. Aleo was also awarded the National Prize of Culture by the Generalitat de Catalunya in the audiovisual sector for the impact of his visual creations. And his latest works explore the possibility of virtual reality combined with a live theater setting. See, and you thought light was just a question of off or on, with maybe a little bit of mood lighting for special occasions. But in the right hands, light can be a tool to create art like paint in the hands of Picasso or Miro. Cool, right? After checking out some of Aleo's work, you will never look at light or the possibilities of the stage combined with technology the same way again. I'm just so impressed with what this guy does. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Thanks for watching. We need two persons for the art to exist, no? It's one trying to, to explain something, a generous person trying to receive it and to understand it and to feel it. It's maybe more important the second one than the first one. I think that we have to say thank you to all the people who appreciate our work and the effort that we do, because they make also a big effort to understand. They are very generous giving their time to our attention. I want to say thank you to the people that enjoy these creations. Well, hello, and thank you for talking with me today. There's so many things I want to ask you, but I'm just going to dive into the questions, if that's okay with you. That's great, thank you. So, in spite of the major role that technology plays in your work, you and your family live in a house that's in the forest, powered by solar energy, right? Do you feel like people, in spite of all the great things technology gives us, need to escape sometimes? Even someone like yourself who really works with technology? Yes, yes, of course. More at these moments when virtuality, it's, it's like the new reality in a way. Living like I live in the mountain, it makes me happy. It makes me like a balance in between the high technological thing where I am always involved like uh, brainy process you know complicated things and to have a little of balance with real deep traditional life in the countryside i think that it's a perfect balance you need to have another point of view also about life not about your work i mean speaking of your work how did you decide to collaborate with for example the ayuntamiento to do these gigantic light projections for La Marseille. I mean, that sounds very different than your life in the forest. So what, what gave you the idea to do this mapping project with the city? You made it look like the Titanic was sinking on the wall of the Ayuntamiento and then turned it into a farmhouse where there were chickens laying eggs. Where do you get these ideas and what is it like using these historic government buildings as your canvas? Really, this is like an accident for me. Originally, it was part of my work from years and years ago in theater. We we was making mapping from 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and it was never called before mapping. One year they asked me to do it, and I really enjoyed it. The first mappings I was making, it was like, wow, it's so powerful, so big, a lot of people, wow, 
yeah, everybody happy. It really is a process I was enjoying a lot. When you are making 10 mappings, 12 mappings, 15 mappings, 20 mappings, then you say, okay, <laughs> maybe it's better that somebody other do it, no? because it's not good to do always the same thing. It's very interesting when you learn things and you are excited about something that you have never done before and everything that it's new for you, it's really exciting. But when it, it becomes like a repetition, you get tired sometimes. You prefer to grow in other aspects of your life and your work and going other directions. And this is what I try to do always. Before the mapping, you started training as a fashion photographer and later working with stage productions as the videographer for the theater collective La Pura del Baus, which I know I pronounced the wrong. For people who are not familiar with their production, they are these spectacular, large scale productions that completely push the boundaries of what performance can be as well as the audience's role in it. So how did you start working with them and how did that influence what you do now? Originally, it was like an accident. Always things happen in life. Sometimes you just go in one direction and crash with somebody and then you make something and then it grows. I meet Pera Tantinha. It's one of the members of them working in photography. He was trying to learn photography. We were talking together and then we, we begin to prepare some kind of exhibition, mixing theater and photography, like changing the idea of what it's a photography. And then we make an exhibition that was kind of machine, photographic machines moving in, in a theatrical way. And it's like now 25 years or 30 working together, sometimes not always, no, because I am not member of this collective, but we are really close friends and we have a very nice relation. We begin making some radical theater at the beginning, and then we have the opportunity to make a kind of opera in Granada. And we was like discovered by Gerard Mortier, who invite us to go to Salzburg. And then we have a big success there, incredible success. And from then, it's a continuous growing in the world of opera around the world. And it's a place where I love to be. We are creating new things always. And at this time, we are preparing La Forza del Destino di Verdi in Florence for next June. Maybe before we make something in Rome, if it's approved by the government. It's like a very exciting world, you know, and, and, and it's so beautiful. You are surrounded by people that are amazing and it's people that makes you better, you know, you, you learn a lot from them. And this is why I am excited about working with opera, no? because the relation with the people, it's, it's great. When you're developing a new project, do you come up with ideas based on projects you'd like to try with new technology? Or is it a collaborative process with all these other people you work with? Or how do these huge productions start? How do they begin? There is a director of the whole project and he has the main concept in his head. In this case, it's Carlos. We work like brothers. We are really collaborative in the creation because he is really generous in this aspect. I work with some directors that are not like this and then it's more difficult. But but uh, with Carlos, it's lovely and we grow together. And we always change the, the original concept of the libretto to make our interpretation of it. And then it lets me to experiment and to make another vision of an old concept right and 100 years ago maybe or more that now it's not really acceptable sometimes like in Turandot my last direction here in Liceu we changed the concept of who is the victim if Turandot is a really bad woman or just a victim about Turandot the production I mean it included elements that you normally wouldn't see in an opera like 3D glasses you know this was not a traditional staging for an opera so do you feel like the opera world is excited when you bring these new things to the table or do you get pushback from the public and from the people you work with? By public, usually it's divided. The conservative side, the classical ones, they don't want to change nothing and to stay with the same opera that always has been done. And these people normally don't like completely what we do. And there is the other side that it's the people that want new kind of air inside the opera house. And this is the one that appreciates our work most. Turandot was a really radical proposal, like very futuristic in a way, was a very big success. It was like a record. If we do it good, it will be well accepted. The original production of this opera, Turandot, is set in ancient China. But as you said, the staging is very futuristic. So how much of this virtual world that you created for the 
these characters is kind of a reflection on the way the world is now with how much we depend on technology, where we're going. Were you trying to use the technology to express a reflection on society or was it just, I want to make this look different than any other production has ever been before? For me, it doesn't matter if it was the past or it was the future, you know? Let's do it in the future, why not? Everybody knows the versions that they have been doing always. I love it also, but there is hundreds of versions like this, no? of the same. Uh, and for me, it was very nice, the opportunity to make a virtual world where it's happening this tour and dot thing. She lives in a world that it's completely virtual, no? So to use a traditional piece of opera, of art, to show people kind of another side of what humanity could be. Dar la vuelta a la tortilla, no? Like, to turn the tables, so to speak, so that it's a reflection of what people are living now or may live in the future. Yes, yes, that's it. And in a way, in this Turandot, it was like a critic to the, the patriarchal system, no? Because the father, uh, using her daughter uh, like an object, because he says, you will be the queen and, and you have to get married with somebody. And then why? Why she must? I wanted to give an opportunity to Turandot that normally it's somebody like a bad person and really it's just like defending herself. I liked that a lot, that you said, look, I want to not only change the staging, but also the perspective we have on these characters, because these productions were written in a time when society saw women very differently, when society in general worked very differently. With that in mind, with the idea of this different perspective, I have to ask you about the Kobots, these huge robotic arms that were a part of the set or the cast. I don't even know why you included them, what they represent, how do they work? I love the robots in a way, no? because I, I like technically how they are done and what they can do now. I wanted to work with robots because it's something that will be really present in a world like this. It's not just robots, they are cobots. Universal Robots, it's a company based here in Barcelona, and they make these cobots. There are like arms that you can program the movements and easily make them things like moving flags, moving lights, moving projectors. For me, the stage design, it was representing like a kind of pyramid that represents the power that it's the prison of Turandot, like a gold jail, like a glass palace. This was representing the arms of the power. I love it and I would like to work more with it. What did the Liceo say when you said, okay, I want there to be two robots in the production? Were they like, okay, or were they like, what? <laughs> Well, you have to think that probably I didn't say I want two robots. Probably I say I want 20 robots. Why don't you have two? It always is like this because the first proposal I make to them, they send me impossible. And then I change some things. I make a new version, similar concept, but completely different scenography. And finally it was possible and we, we did it. I was really impressed by the reviews that I read as well as statements that the cast members made because everybody, everybody said that in spite of these massive striking images that you created that none of the images ever overwhelmed the music that they supported the musical aspect of the productions. I don't think that's easy to do if you have two robot arms on stage. How much does the music impact your design for the stage? When you work in opera, if you don't understand that music is the first, you cannot work there. Music first and later the staging. I mean, there is like a kind of priorities that you have to, to be really clear. You have to give the idea of something and let them grow, no? You cannot be really concrete. Speaking of the Liceo, I used to live right nearby and you were one of the creators behind the gastronomic space that used to be underneath the Liceo, the Opera San Paina, and I was so sorry that it closed. That place was amazing. What was the inspiration to create that place and then what happened to it? It was, it was such a unique place. Roca Brothers, the brothers in Girona, they was number one in the top restaurants, the Star Michelin, and they, they are incredible people. And we make together an experience that was called El Somni, that it was the first time that we was making like an opera on a table with projections on the table and around. I work with 10 composers making music for each course. It was like incredible experience, you know. And then somebody called me to do like an, a version of that here in Barcelona 
Barcelona under the Liceu and we was working together but the marketing aspects of this project was like really confused there was something that makes it not work commercially it was like a very beautiful crazy ambient that we create a lot of creators there working together and when you was there it was like whoa what where I am I don't know I enjoy a lot because it was maybe two years working like crazy all kind of disciplines together everything to make a restaurant no in a way it was like incredible adventure I mean, you've worked all over the world, but do you feel like Barcelona is a city that supports different, innovative, crazy projects, or is it difficult? It's difficult, really. Eh? It was better 100 years ago. People had a lot of money to invest in a crazy way. Now there are other countries that they are more enthusiastic with this kind of risky business. We need changes. I think, especially in cultural side. No? I mean, I don't say that there is not good business here, but the cultural things, there is not big budget. It's very difficult. You have to work around. Why do you stay in Barcelona? I have other things in my life than work. Work is what more I love and what I do all the time, but it's also other things. I love this country. There is a lot of things that I appreciate but there are some things that I would like to change. They invest in art and cultural things and so it's not like it was. What part of the process would you say the part that you love the most about your work? Could you pick a part that you love the most? The thing that I like the most in my work is that I am continuously learning. This is my main motivation to work. You enjoy a lot of this process. In opera it's very complicated but at the end there is like kind of explosion and the premiere you are completely dead and then you go home again. And that's a very nice thing, you know, it's, it's lovely. Really. It sounds like somebody who's running a marathon, but when you're done, you're dead, but it feels amazing, no? Yes, in a way it's like this, and it's so emotional. There is a good energy, you see it in the singers, no? You see it around, every day it's growing and growing and some surprises coming last minute that you didn't expect that it happened. And then you have a kind of emotional hard thing, you know, that when it's finished, it's like, wow. You mentioned you're about to go to Rome, possibly. What new projects do you have coming up, opera or otherwise? Or is there a project you'd like to do in the future? I am making these two operas, maybe some repetition the other summer. I, I don't know, maybe something in Taiwan, I'm not sure. What I am doing more is creating like kind of fractal images by myself. It's not for a... I continue working, maybe I will make an exhibition next year, enjoying the process. And this is what I am doing now. I'm trying to enjoy life. And... Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Thank you, Frank, for hanging out with us here at the Metropolitan Culture Corner. I just love these interviews because what we see as the audience is the final result. We see these huge stage productions, impressive, beautiful, inspiring. But then to sit down with the person who came up with this idea in their head, from their house, and then later somehow made it a reality with the help of their team. I think that's so special. So thank you, Barcelona Metropolitan, for making it possible to get to know these nationally and internationally recognized and universally awesome creative people who live right here in Barcelona. Tune in next month to get to know our next special guest. Tune in every month to Metropolitan's YouTube channel for the Metropolitan Culture Corner. Thank you so much again for watching, and thank you again, Frank Aleu. We are looking forward to seeing what kind of projects you come up with this year, next year, and beyond.